tonight on The Roundtable. Playing a role-playing game allows you to test out, like, what would it feel like to have someone refer to me with a different pronoun than I'm used to. Adam Koval, co-designer of award-winning tabletop RPG Dungeon World. Allowing you to step into somebody else's shoes for a period of time gives you the chance to learn experiences that they would, that you would never have the opportunity to. Matthew Mercer, voice actor and dungeon master of Critical Role. You know, I can feel myself getting a bit emotional, because, like, for me, it was just like I shared something with him for the first time. And Mark Holmes, GM of High Rollers on Yogg's Cast. I'm not sure I even know how to make friends in real life anymore. <laughs> <laughs>
out of the game. And it's safer, right? It kind of gives you that, that safer environment to test these things out because it's your friends, they're all doing a similar thing, and so you have that slight confidence and things like that. Um, a friend of mine, part of our long-standing D&D group for a long time, I really think it helped him with his uh, kind of accepting his sexuality and coming out to like his family and things like that because you know he, he would often try these things out and play around and our weekly game became his chance to kind of play around. That plays to the kind of the, the, the lesson of empathy. Allowing you to step into somebody else's shoes for a period of time gives you the chance to learn experiences that they would, that you would never have the opportunity to. I think it has helped me grow as a person in kind of like expanding my worldview. Like, you know, having to like go, okay, you know, because I want to have an interesting cast of characters, I want to have gay characters, I want to have, you know, characters of different genders to, to you know, biological genders and things like that. And and I felt like I've had to go out there and learn a lot and that, that's helped me immensely. Yeah. Like, you know, like we, we played a game of, uh, of Shadowrun on, on Roleplay that I think, touched on uh, racism in a lot of really interesting ways because that's a core theme of the game, right? It's part of the setting of that game and it's extruded in the way that a lot of fantasy racism is in that like it's not about uh, the kinds of racism we see in the real world, but it's like you're a troll and I don't like you because of that, but it allows you to do that kind of soft metaphorical soft, approach yeah. to the same thing. Uh, my, my first girlfriend for many years was, was Muslim. It's become really frustrating in recent years to have a lot of people who don't understand or research the religion to speak out against it. And uh, I've been very verbal uh, about, well, read about it before you speak out again, before you go ahead and make your minds up, go go ahead and actually research, understand this. Information is the key to this. Um, and so like in creating part of, of my universe on Corel, uh, a lot of it is very Arabic you know, influenced and, and a lot of the same cultural understanding comes in there. And even, even through researching that, I've, gain an even further understanding of, of the variations between our culture and that culture and the similarities. I tend to not GM games that are in a completely uh, fantastic uh, world, right? Like I don't play a ton of just straight up Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I often play games that are sci-fi because I, I use them to explore things that are true about the real world. And yeah. I think sci-fi is much better at that than fantasy. Mm -hmm. It's like in, in GMing uh, Swan Song, partway through that campaign, it's a sci-fi campaign set in the future, but it's a world the, that's settled by people from Earth. And uh, part of the universe we, we kind of developed to have been um, settled by a caliphate, by Islamic uh, settlers. And I didn't know much about like, Islam as a thing. So I just like read a bunch of books and like spent some time doing that research mm. so that I could feel like if not directly from my own experience, I could at least speak to with some degree of authenticity about the experience of people who are different from me. Yeah. I, I firmly believe that 99% of the world's problems stem from miscommunication. Mm. And if we as a people could learn to just be open to learning about each other from across the table, yeah. uh, we could solve so many problems. And so that, that type of a, a mindset going into this and when you're creating your world can not just broaden your horizons as a person, but your players as well. Have you ever said out with that as a as a goal to say like I have an idea of a, a theme that mm. I want to explore in the next arc or in this campaign and like set out from the get-go to do that it's not something I've done yet it's something that I'm definitely working on less so for the GMing side of things but more the writing side of things like there's there's books and stories that I want to write that touch on things that I just don't have the knowledge of because it's it's not about a straight white guy I made sure to to set it as as a sort of cultural mixing pot, you know, everyone came to this place, and as such, a lot of these, these cultural differences are normal and at least understood or respected in certain space. However, future campaign elements might play into a part of the world where it's not that case, and I think mm -hmm. those are themes that I'm intentionally looking forward to exploring and am being very active in learning from and taking uh, examples and, mm. and you know, informational understandings from communities that might better know this experience than yeah. I would as a person. Yeah. So I look forward to that. Well, I think, I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because we're, we're developing this, this space where now we have to consider the audience as a part of our, a part of our game. You know, when we were, we were getting set up for uh, the most recent campaign that I started, uh, Nebula Jazz, mm. uh, I had to pick the cast, the people who were playing with me, and I had to pick a game that would fit with them and the kind of themes and things we wanted to do with that game. But I had to keep in mind that there were people that were going to be watching this, and so I had to pick a system that would be entertaining to watch mm -hmm. that would also fit with the, the group and with the game. And, that that falls generally on the GM to do, even though yeah. it's not. I mean, you're in the the pre. You're not the GM yet. You're going to be, but you're still just a person in a group of other people. Mm -hmm. But because we tend to be the ones that are experienced in these things, and we understand the different games that are out there, and we we're still on our golden throne as game master, <laughs> viewing the the world below us. You know, we are expected to know this stuff and come to the table with it. We've had since this kind of resurgence in tabletop gaming. I've we've had a lot of fans who've sent 
pictures of their game groups. It's like, you know, hey, look, we're getting together on this day. Thanks, yeah. guys, you gave us the inspiration. And that's really cool. A lot of them I'm seeing are families. This is becoming their family game nights. And I think that's such a cool, wonderful experience. I just like was checking out the, they've done a My Little Pony role playing game, like an official one, right? And one of the things that I was talking to, the guy who designed it, his playtest group was his daughter, his like seven year old daughter and her friends. Hmm. And I was just like, these are the games that are going to bring up that next generation, and like I just love that idea of like you know the dads being the GM or the mum being the GM and like teaching the kids. And what a great way to spend time with not just your your children, but also you know their friends and get a way to know them and everything like that. Like I think that's super sweet. Very much so. It's a real good. It's the it's the the kind of passing on of the torch in a environment that's already very kind of based on that oral tradition. That like mm. I learned from my game master who learned from his game master <laughs> all the yeah, way we back to the that. Gygax before us. <laughs> right? Like there are people who can trace the lineage of their learning the, the game one. all the way yeah, all the way back to its its inception. And I think that that's a thing that we are we're never really gonna lose from from Dungeons and Dragons and from role playing games generally is that idea that you can you can say everyone can say who they learned it from. I remember I remember the very first time it was a birthday I had and I invited all my friends over to play D&D and it was going to be like a 10 hour game and we had snacks and drink and everything else. And I was really worried because my dad is a big British builder, he loves his football and his beer and I was like, okay, and I was really worried because I was like, oh, he's going to make fun of us, like it's all this kind of stuff. And we played and he didn't speak, to, like the only thing he would come in is like, does anybody want to drink? And then that was it, that's fine. And then after we finished, he went home and he had been listening the whole time and he was like, oh yeah, when your friend Harry did this, that was really cool and you know, he was just, and he was engaged with it and like that was really big to me, like, sure. you know, I can feel myself getting a bit emotional because like for me, it was just like I shared something with him for the first time. Yeah. Something that I didn't think he could understand. Uh, yeah, I would have. I would have loved as a kid to have been able to have that relationship with my parents that I could say like, "This is D and I'm really into it," and like, "Maybe you want to play with me and stuff." But they just were not in that space. As much as it started so shitty for me, that to me was like a, a very ther therapeutic experience as a young kid when I was a teenager in that year where you're trying to figure yourself out. Mm -hmm. You know, after after many years of being told you're not supposed to play, you're learning to be an adult. You're not allowed to use your imagination a bunch. You have to learn about you know, sciences and history, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I think they can all work together. Mm. I think the thing that appeals to uh, kids and like early teenagers um, about role-playing games is that ability to test out different identities. Yeah. Um, and I think that you see this not just in, in people who are in a formative age, but people who are going through any kind of formative change uh, in, their, in their life. Playing a role-playing game allows you to test out, like, what would it feel like to have someone refer to me with a different pronoun than I'm used mm -hmm. to? Or what would it feel like to play a character of a, a different gender than I am? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it, it gives, like teenagers especially, because they're all going through that, it gives you a chance to be like, well, what if I was like a different kind of person, right? Mm -hmm. What if I was more like this? Yeah. You know, when you create a character in a game, from a player's standpoint, you tend to create a character that's a reflection of yourself. It's a, mm. it's a mirror, even mm. as strange and different as it may be. Uh, that that first experience, you're you're not looking to step outside of the boundaries of what you're already comfortable with. And the longer that game goes, the more you learn about yourself because mm. you you get more comfortable. You begin to step past those boundaries that you yourself in your day to day life uh, feel constantly constrain you. Mm -hmm. And I think that in itself is is a, a very therapeutic experience in teaching yourself how to be more comfortable and step beyond those boundaries outside of the game. Well, what's yeah. what's weird and funny about this this whole thing though is that we're we're talking about this in the context of a game whose core behavioral structure is kill things. <laughs> like, murder things that are not like you until they are dead and take the things that belong to them so that you can empower yourself for more murdering. <laughs> my, my last girlfriend, we, she was part of my, my uh, expedition to, to Ravenloft game we ran for two and a half years. And like I remember the time that I killed her character. And it was a terrible, horrible moment for all of us communally, but it was also such a great narrative moment and it left such a great story beat going forward that afterward I was like, I'm sorry. She's like, don't be sorry. If I wanted to go, this is how it should be. <laughs> so I wanna, I, wanna tell, I wanna tell a story that as yeah, a game yeah, master I'm very, I'm very proud of. So uh, any, any game master can kill a character. Um, but I've I've killed a relationship. So, <laughs> oh, shit. so I was we were playing Dungeons and Dragons. I think it was fourth edition, and uh, I, I played with the same group for a long time. And, and one of them had uh, had brought their uh, this person they were dating uh, along to the group. And like, mm -hmm. you know, they've never played D and D before. We're gonna get them into the game, and uh, we were in a fairly intense combat encounter. And uh, this this person's character was you know on the on the verge of, of their demise, and uh, and they were like, cool, I'm gonna I'm gonna run in. I'm gonna go fight the I'm gonna run in and fight the monsters. And the, the person they were dating, you know, they were like, you know, you only have like three hit points, right? 
like, yeah, whatever, it's fine. I'm, I'm tough. I got a, I got a plus one sword. I'm, I'm good. It's gonna be fine. Mm -hmm. And, he, and they're like, don't. I, I really think you shouldn't do this. And they're like, whatever, I'm gonna do it. And they run in, immediately dead. It's like instant, like just massive damage, <laughs> totally killed. <laughs> And, of course, because the, the person in the group was like, I played a bunch before, they're like, that was a stupid move. Like, you shouldn't have done that. I told you. And they ended up getting in a big fight about it. Oh, uh, not no. at the table, but there was that tension of like, that we're going to talk about this later. Next week, it was just, it was, we were absent one person. <laughs> oh, I was man. like, so what happened? And they're like, yeah, we got in a big fight after the game about it, and uh, then we broke up. You know what? Actually, <laughs> playing, in, playing into our, our, our theme for this discussion, it amplifies things that might not also work well between your interactions yeah. at the table. I, I felt, I, honestly, like I was sad that that happened, but I'm also very proud of being like, yeah, see, I revealed unto you the truth of your relationship. <laughs> it's true. It's a, it's a heightened catalyst space. And yeah. so it will bond people together, but if there, if there is some sort of a conflict, if there are personalities that will not mingle well, you'll realize very quickly. Yeah. And that, that's yeah. kind of the, the finesse of running a game group is you have to build a a group of people together you think will mesh well. Yeah, like that's really mind blowing for me. Like those stories, like that that ability to no matter how much time, like that relationship you build with that player group, is really it's stronger than a normal friendship because yeah. you've you've done things together that normal people just can't do. And and yes, they're imaginary and they're dice based, but you've slayed dragons, you've overcome, you've you've taken over worlds or ships. Yeah. I'm not sure I even know how to make friends in real life anymore. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm at the point now where I'm like, so we've hung out like two or three times, you, um, you wanna play D&D? &D? Yeah. Yeah. No? All right, well it was nice knowing you. D&D &D um, and chill, I, I, I bring board <laughs> games and a set of dice with me to more, most social encounters, just in case. Just in case. Just in case That's we important. need a nice break. You never, like, you never know when d and is just gonna break out. Yeah. Yeah. No, dude, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. 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 That's exactly why these game experiences do enrich us as human beings, even though it's a small, localized, imaginative space with your friends at a table with dice and Cheetos and shit. You know, it's, <laughs> but it's, it's that's, that, that's philosophy, right? Yeah, like Plato's, exactly. Plato's cave doesn't literally exist. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's a, it's a figurative model to help you understand things about the real world. Yes. Mm. So by playing games that have mechanisms for dealing with specific stuff, you're going to be forced to deal with it mechanically. Correct. It, it becomes part of that game. Um, and you can, you can explore uh, s sort of strange or, or alternate settings with a game, but you're still playing Dungeons and Dragons. The players are still being rewarded with experience points for overcoming monsters. Right. Uh, and they, they're still getting treasure, and it's still the core themes that are built into the narrative. Um, I think to play D&D &D and to explore things that are not those things, you have to have a group that's willing to do all the work for the game. I can agree with that. Yeah. And what's cool is any of those elements, those different types of rule sets that you explore, if there's things that work within the game or that certain group of players that everyone seems to like and really adhere to or resonate with, you can borrow elements or mm. tweak that into other systems to move on to. Yeah. Uh, I've played games in the past that have been an amalgamation of uh, like like the Amber Dice, this role playing game we were talking about earlier, elements of that merged in with like some World of Darkness. I liked this particular rule set for social combat, minimized sure. from like the Exalted Universe, and then you kind of cobble together your own game. The, the danger there is that you end up with a horrific Chimera that just is stillborn on the table before you get to do anything, <laughs> right? Because game design is a real thing, and these games are are built ostensibly as as you know constructed systems, and so by hacking off limbs from them and sewing them together, you, you might get an owl bear, but you might get a gibbering mouther instead. No, this is a valid point. So very good. It's, 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 point, yeah. it's, it's dangerous, right? But I also think, and and this is a thing that I try to reinforce constantly with people who are new to role playing games or people who are GMs. Maybe the the core thing that we can do is just inspire people to find their own creativity. Whether yeah. that's looking at us and saying like, "I like this style of GMing. Maybe this D and D thing isn't so hard. I'm going to try it with my own friends." Yeah. Or being like, "I don't really want to play D and D, but I like hearing your descriptions of worlds or characters, and I'm going to get into like watercolor or sculpting or whatever." That's where the the real meaningful stuff comes from. Yeah, I've yeah. I've I can't, oh man, I mean not to bring it down. I I can't tell you in the past since we started our show how many emails or personal conversations I've had with fans at events that have come up and said, thank you for the show you do. I wouldn't be here if sure, not for yeah, this. Yeah. And every single time it, it rocks me to my core. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's both so it crazy to consider that yeah. the, that this, this silly game and world that we create with our friends that is essentially made for us and for our audience to watch has can have such, has perhaps such a profound effect on somebody to, to give them Renewed inspiration to keep living, yeah. and and you and every single one of those stories comes to a point like and because of that, 
this has happened and this has yeah. happened. You've helped yeah. me realize that there is more beyond that pit of darkness and depression that is that is clutched. Yeah. And I've been in those places in my life. I know many people who have been in those depths of depression. So it's this it's this wonderful human connective point that, you know, reminds me that even the smallest bits of artistic creation in this world can mean something so special to somebody out there and that's why we do it. Yeah. Well and the, the yeah. advantage the advantage that we have is that we're in a space where the distance between us and those people is so small. We're only a tiny step away from the people that care about the things that we make. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and I think that's that's fascinating. It can be a trial, but I think for the most part that that closeness with the with the fans is what for me makes it different and, and worth doing. Yeah, very um, much yeah, no, so. Absolutely you know, great. Absolutely. One of the crazy experiences I've ever had in my life was seeing the first Critter Babies born this past year. Oh. People who met through the fandom of our show who then went ahead and got married and had children. I'm just like, and a few of them named them after players. Oh, and man. I don't know what to do with that. It's really weird. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I guess I guess at the end of it, if life is about legacy for a lot of people, like let that what be a, your legacy. What a man. strange world we live in that people are meeting and having sex because of Dungeons and Dragons. Yes! Yes! yes. yes.